I want to talk to you this morning about something that I've, I've spoken to you before about. And, and, uh, and, you know, I just, this has been on my heart a little bit. Uh, and I want to talk to you about being the type of person that God uses. That I want to be the type of person that God uses. I guess that's what all of us really want to be is the type of person that God would use. But I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach, kind of come in the back door a little bit here uh, and talking about the type of person that God uses. Uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna start off by saying that, that what we all need and what, what our nation needs and what, what, our, what our churches need is we need more of the presence of God. Amen. Come on, can I get a witness? Amen. We need more of the presence of God. We need it more in our corporate worship, but we also need it more in our individual lives, in our personal lives. What we need is we need more of the presence of God. The presence of God has the capacity to heal you. The presence of God, when the presence of God shows up in a place, it can change a room. It can do what only the presence of God can do. We, I want to, there's several, there's several different, uh, you know, uh, dimensions of God's presence, but I want to talk to you really quick. Just, just lay it out here really quick. Three dimensions of God's presence that I see. And the first one is the omnipresence of God. And we know what the omnipresence of God is. The omnipresence of God means that God, God's presence is everywhere. There is, there is no other being. There is no other, there is none other that their presence, not even the devil. The devil thinks he can be everywhere. He wants you to believe that he can be everywhere. But there is none other that can be everywhere at the same time other than God. I love what Psalm 139, it says this, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? There is nowhere to go you see because his presence is everywhere the second kind of presence that we see is the presence of God in us and that is part of that omnipresence of God but it, it, it is it is worthy of talking about because it is the presence of God that resides on the inside of us aren't you thankful today for the presence of God that resides on the inside of us come on now amen I love what first Corinthians three sixteen. it says do you not know that you are the temple of the living God and his presence dwells inside of you. The presence of God. So there's the omnipresence of God and then there's that indwelling presence of God but then there is also that manifest presence of God. Uh, I love in 1 Kings it talks about how when they were getting ready to dedicate the temple and the, the, the manifest, that everybody was in place, the singers and, and, and the, 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 the musicians and, the, and everybody was ready to have church that morning and the, and the speakers stood up to the priest stood up to, to 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 give a word and all of a sudden he couldn't say anything he just speak why because the manifest tangible presence of God showed up in a room oh I love that I love that I love it when the manifest tangible presence of God shows up in a room I had some people tell me one time well I've had it ha said so many times where people said man God showed up I said really how do you know God people run all over the place they were running all people run all over the place people doing it you know what I really believe that maybe God showed up I, I, I'm not saying that God doesn't show up in that way but I, I really believe that when the manifest presence of the living God shows up we ain't gonna be running around yeah, y'all with me now? We ain't gonna be running around. That I, I believe everybody gonna stand still when the man of shown up, manifest presence of God shows up in a place. I, I love the Bible says that Adam and Eve were walking in, in, with God and talking with God in the Garden of Eden. And you know what would show up? It was talking about how the manifest, tangible presence of God would show up in the garden. And the Bible says that when they sinned, they went and they hid themselves. They went and hid themselves. And see, that's what sin will do. Sin will cause you to go and hide yourself. Because that's, that's what sin does. It always calls us to run and hide and get away from the presence of God. So what we find out there is we find out that you can leave the presence of God. You can leave it. You can leave the presence of God. The Bible says that Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of God. The Bible says that Jonah went down to, God told him to go to Nineveh. Go, go to Nineveh and preach to the Ninevites. And what does he do? He goes down to Joppa and he catches a boat and he goes in 2300 miles in the opposite direction to Tarsh he goes there away from, and the Bible says he goes out of the presence of God so what we find is that you can leave the presence of God but you can also come on now you can also enter into the presence of God 
You can enter into the presence of God. I love what Psalm 95 says. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him. I love what Psalm 100, it says this right here. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence presence with singing so how do how do we enter in to his presence we enter in his presence and we have to come to him by by on purpose there has to be a purpose in you you come into the lord you're not going to just just stumble on the lord no no there is we we we're going to purpose ourselves you know what we done you know what we're doing this morning we have purposed ourselves to gather in this house we set a time that we were going to be and we're going to meet here and we got we we got the singers ready we got the the praise team ready we got everybody ready and we and we're ready and we've got the word ready and we purposed ourselves that we were going to come here and we were we're going to seek after the presence of God. You know what that is? That is a hunger and it God God responds to the hunger of his people. The people if you want more of God in your life, then it's going to be determined by the hunger that is on the inside of you. If you want more of God, God can be found. Hey, amen. I'm going to preach my message this morning. If you want more of God, God can be found. We also enter we also enter into his presence through worship, through worship. We're not here this morning just, just singing our songs because these are, these are the, the latest and the greatest. You know, it, 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 we, they, this is what they're playing on the fish. No, it, it, it ain't about that. No, it's about getting everybody. And this is why I said what I said up front is because it's about getting everybody to a place to where everything that you dealt with all week long becomes to pale in comparison to the glory of the king. That he's here in the room. He showed up in the room why did he show up because i came and i i challenged him at his word that we're two or more gathered so i came i got up this morning i didn't feel like coming i didn't feel like I, it was hard to get here we fought all the way to church but i'm here praise god can i tell you what and then you start to raise your hands and all of a sudden all of that stuff starts to fall off and you know what we we understand we understand that we can enter into his presence through worship i love corporate worship but can I tell you something, brothers and sisters, you can also enter into his presence on an individual basis. You don't have to have a single person around you. Just get alone. I challenge you, I challenge you. Well, some of my favorite worship is me worshiping him alone. Getting alone, putting on music, and just all of a sudden, just get to the place where you say, God, here I am. And you know what I found out? That God will meet you there. So we enter into his presence through worship, we also enter into his presence through being obedient. Through obedience, alignment. When we get obedient to God, we, we enter into his presence by, by doing what he tells us to do. So we find out that you can leave his presence by being disobedient and you can enter into his presence by being obedient to God. Can I tell you something? It's just that simple. It's just that simple. And you know what? God made a way. But you know what I'm seeing in the church today? What I'm seeing in the church today is I'm seeing a spirit of withholding in the church where people are holding on to things in their life. A spirit of withholding where we don't want to come and we don't want to bring all our junk and we don't want to bring all our stuff and we don't want to bring all our issues and we don't want to bring them because we're afraid that somebody might talk about us. And that's exactly what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to hold on to it. He wants you to hold on to it. He wants you to carry it around. He wants you to stick it deep down on the inside till it gets in your soul, you know, until you, it, it becomes your DNA. It becomes your identity and you're carrying it around with you all the time. And what it'll do is it'll always, anytime we hold on the spirit of, of withholding, what it wants to do is it causes us to hold on to things in our life. And when we hold on to those things, it stops the release of God into our life it'll stop the release of god and eventually it will bring us to a place to where we become bankrupt who am i talking to we become bankrupt because we've held on to everything and not released anything to god now i'm telling you it, it happens we see it so many times and we hear it of course you hear it you know, in church, you hear, you know, give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shake together, full measure, your cup overflows. Oh, and I see, I see couples like I, me and Donna, Pastor Donna, we, we struggled for, for years in the early in tithing. I struggled more than she did. 
and, and, and tithing and giving. And what we understand is that when, you, you, when we release something, we, what we're doing is we're trusting God and we're believing God then what it does is it opens up the windows of heaven and allows God to bless us. But it's also true, not just with your money, but it's also true in, with, when it comes to dealing with past sin. Uh, what the enemy wants us to do is harbor the past sin. He wants us to harbor the hurt. He wants us to harbor the unforgiveness. He wants us to harbor all of those things that are past sin. Maybe, maybe not just past sin, but maybe also he wants us to harbor the present things, the present sin that's going on in our life. Because he knows if we won't release that to God, then there's no way that God can come. God is God. He can do anything he wants to do. But his word says that what we are willing to release to him, he's willing to bless us in that area of our life. And I believe that with all of my heart. Believing, I just don't, I just don't believe. And many times I hear people say this, I just don't believe that God can still do this today. Can I tell you something? We withhold. And we say, I, I'm withholding this. Because I don't, I don't believe that God can do this today. I don't believe that God can meet me at the point of my need. I don't believe that God can show up when I need him. And what we do is we withhold. I'll carry this with me. It's what some of you are going to do this morning is some of you are going to go out of this place and you're going to go out with a spirit of withholding and you're going to carry it with you. It happens every single week. But there are some of you who are going to believe enough that you're going to release some things into the house today. And guess what God is going to do? Give and it shall be given unto you. Press down it's not just your money but it's about everything and every issue in our life but what we do is we find ourselves in our comfort zones we get into those places of comfort and you know what a place of comfort is don't you a place of comfort is a place where we just get so settled in that place we become lethargic in that place mm. y'all quiet in this methodist church <laughs> I mean, we get lethargic and we, we get comfortable and, and we get in our comfort zone. You know, you know, one of the most comfortable places for me is, is in a, my easy chair at the house. And you know what? When I sit down in that chair and put my feet up, I'm not good for anything. Don't matter how many looks I get. <laughs> Don't matter how many comments I get. I'm there. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in my comfort zone. And, and, and unfortunately, this is where a lot of church folk get. We get in our comfort. Do you know what? This, this is exactly what the enemy wants. He, wants. he wants our churches. He wants our churches to get into a place of comfort. You know, pa pastor, you know, here, here, here's where we are, pastor. You know, just, just, if you'll just stick to a certain, a certain way of preaching, uh, I, I, I'll be comfortable in that place. And, and I, don't, I, don't have to, I don't have to hear about my short. I don't want to hear what is really sin. I don't, I don't want to don't hear, you know, about, about those things. And I don't want to hear about hell. I don't want to hear because, you know, I'm comfortable in my believing that it don't exist. And I'm comfortable in my believing that, that it's all going to just, that, you know, we, we all, we want to live that pan theory. You know, everything's just going to pan out in the end you know and we get we get to that comfortable and this is where a lot of what where a lot of church is gotten today and i'm telling you we we got some answering to do to god because because a lot of churches as we want to make you comfortable we want you to have parking spaces right up at the door i mean we don't want you to have to walk uh, right up at the door we when we, when you come in we want you to feel good cold air conditioned we want coffee the aroma to be in the air bathrooms to be perfect and clean if if you can't if you can't get right at the door we got a golf cart we're gonna pick you up we're gonna bring you to the door let you out i'll be waiting on you when it's over take you back and then we're gonna come in here and we're gonna have it's got to be the best praise and word best child care it's got to be the best i knew what we do we get into that place of comfort and what i find out is there's a lot of pastors that get to that place to where they just, oh, everything's just got to be, it's just got to be so, so, so. And there's nothing wrong with excellence, but what a lot of pastors, and I was here for a long time, is they don't want to lose their job. So I'm going to keep you comfortable so I don't have to lose my job. Man, I was, I was in the Methodist church for years, and I tried it, keeping everybody, and guess what? I lost my job.
So I came to say, I ain't scared of none of you. <laughs> you didn't put me in this job. You can't take me out. God placed me here, praise God. And I hope my prayer is, my prayer is that you never get comfortable I hope you leave a lot of time saying, oh my goodness, woo! I have people tell me all the time, preach you was preaching to me, yep. Preach you was, man, you would just single me out, yep, I did. Because you know why? Because I had to deal with it yesterday, yep, I sure did. Because I never preach a message to you that God don't get me first. I want you to understand that. And I didn't come here to tickle your ears. I didn't come here to make you feel good. All of that stops at the door in here. There is a power that cannot be denied, that can only come from the truth of God's word because his truth has the, yeah, yeah, yeah. His truth has the capacity to set you free. His truth, Chris, it can set you free. Hey, listen, Daryl's word can't set you free. The doctor's word can't set you free. The psychiatrist can't set you free. The lawyer can't set you free. There is nothing that can set you free like the name of Jesus. His truth. Ah. His truth. His truth. It can set you free. Listen, I, I'm telling you when, you, when you read the word of God, you'll find out, my little phone's going crazy. When you, when, you read, when you read the word of God, you find out that Jesus, he didn't care who he, whose feelings he hurt. People are like, well, you know, Jesus is all about love. Just love, love, love. Mm. He would also tell them, if you don't do this, you're going to hell. Man, I could just, woo. Some of y'all like, some of them visitors like, what, what, what type of church you say this was? Hey, buddy, let me give you this. Here you go. Thank you. That thing's buzzing and dinging and everything else. It ain't used to nobody preaching. Just. Don't you love it when you're sitting in the room and all of a sudden Siri comes on and says, I didn't hear what you, what you say? <laughs> you're like, shut up, Siri. <laughs> I, but, I, but I'm serious. Jesus preached the uncompromised word of God. He preached the truth and it didn't matter who got offended. Did he not love people? Sure he did. He loved them so much for God, so loved the world that he gave. Jesus went and bled, died on the cross. Don't you know that there was a magnitude of that? That there was a reason, there was something that was so dire that he would choose to disrobe his heavenly glory and clothe himself in a vesture of clay and come to earth and bleed and die on a cross when no one else could do it, only God. Oh, you ought to be thankful right there that God loved you so much that he didn't withhold the truth from you. That he wasn't, he wasn't going to withhold the truth. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Don't none of us like the tough places in life. None of us like the pits in life. None of us like the dips in life. None of us like the valleys that are in our life. You think I do? As a pastor, man, you think, well, pastor, I know you just, you just kind of float around, you know, and you just, all, no, man, I'm going to tell you something. I deal with it. The dips, the pits, the valleys, all of those things, they show up in all of our lives. But can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? You need the dips, the pits, and the valleys in life. We need them so bad. Because it's those dips and those valleys in our life that's going to make us stronger and make us better at what God has called us to be about. Man, I look around this room and I see people because you know what? You know what it does when you survive it? 
It gives you a testimony, don't it? Come on now, I'm looking for some survivors in this place this morning. Anybody in here survived something? Anybody in here been to hell and know you survived it because you went through it right there? Anybody in here says, you know what, Pastor Darrell, I tell you, I didn't think I was going to make it. I was at my wit's end, but God showed up. And I know that he'll make a way where there is no way. Chris, you know what I'm talking about. Steve, you know what I'm talking about. Man, you, you, you got your purpose back, praise God. You said, I'd never write again. You don't wrote about three more books, praise God. Lisa, you and Richie, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all said, man, man, our marriage was over, but God, it showed up when it needed to show. Phil, you know what I'm talking about. Man, you were strung out. You were strung out. I knew this man. I knew this man. I knew him way back yonder. And I know what God done in his life. God set him free from all of that. Jessica, you know what I'm talking about. God set you free even from prescription drugs, praise God. I'm telling you this morning, we serve a God. Matt, you know what I'm talking about. Man, you didn't, you didn't have no purpose, no meaning, but look what God done in your life, praise God. I could go all over this room. God done a work. That's my God. That's the God that I serve today. And you know what every one of these people, and you know what you have this morning? You have a testimony. A testimony of the goodness of God and that you survived it. And because you survived it, you're better. You're better. And now, what it's done, listen to me very carefully. I'm fixing to preach my message. <laughs> what it's done is prepare you to be the type of person that God can use. God can't use no jelly. You know, somebody just like, I'm just, you know, put me on the schedule. I might show up, I might not. You know. Well, you know. And my mouth's always just belly aching and whining. Come on, you don't, come on, step up. Step up. Let's, let's be the type of person that God can use. Right here. Let's be a person that holds itself up and says, wait a minute now. I ought to be dead, but I'm alive, praise God. And if God don't do nothing else in my life, I'm going to serve him for the rest of my life because look what he's already done. Now, you just, now, don't you just know you look back over your life and you, don't you just know that it could have went in so many ways and so many times it could have ended and you not even really have a relationship. And what we do so many times is we just want to live like the world and God to bless us right there in the midst of it. Just bless us, Lord. Bless me while I'm living with this woman. I'm going to preach my message. <laughs> bless me. Bless me while I'm, I'm dealing with these alternative lifestyles. Ble bless me. Bless me, Lord. Just, just bless me. I want you to just come down here and just bless me. Why? Because, because after all, I am who I am. No, no. Let me tell you what God honors. God doesn't honor just because you are who you are. God honors people who will go after his word. You see, you see, you want more presence than you, when you, the more presence you get, y'all ain't going to hear me. The more presence you get, the more it prepares you to be the type of person that God uses. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when you surrender your life to God, it will wreck you. It will wreck you. There'll be none of this. Well, you know, I gave my life to the Lord, but I'm still cussing. You know, I gave my life to the Lord, but I'm still fornicating. You know, I gave my life to the Lord, but I still like to go to the bars and hang out. You know, I, I gave my life to the Lord, but I'm saying nothing changed. I still hang out with it. No, 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 no. You need to go back to the well and drink again. Because I don't th I think you've been deceived. I don't think you got what you thought you got. Because according to what, m what, the, what my Bible says, the word of God says that when God shows up, he's going to change your life. Not just some things, everything's going to change. People are going to look at you and say, what in the world has happened to him? 
what in the world happened to that girl? You know, she was loose. She was doing all this stuff. And all of a sudden now, she want to go to church all the time. She's all the time. She got this glow about her. Praise and glory be to God. You know what happened? God showed up. God showed up. Hmm. Ah, let me preach my message. So the type of person that God uses is a person that always makes themselves available. Make yourself available. Listen, I might not get past this point. Make yourself available. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Make yourself available. I had to. And you know what you have to deal, deal with when you make yourself available? God's not going to make you available. God's already done everything he's going to do. So really, it's, the ball is not in God's court. It's in yours. Now, you make yourself available. How do you do that? Well, I'm going to deal. You might have to deal with some generational stuff. Now, we don't talk about this in church, you know. You might have to deal with some generational stuff. I had to deal with some generational stuff. My mom and dad, they're sitting right here. They had to deal with some generational stuff. And you know what? That generational stuff went on for generations. But there has to come a place in your life to where you say, wait a minute. Right here is where it's going to stop. It's not going to be passed on to my children and to my children's children. It stops right here. There has to come a time when we draw the line in the sand. And I don't know who I'm talking to in here today. But maybe that alcohol addiction is a generational thing that you have yet to deal with. Maybe, maybe, just maybe that looseness, maybe that fornication, maybe that lust, maybe that anger, maybe that is a generational thing that you have yet to deal with. There comes a time when we have to deal with it. Oh, I could, I could preach you a love message, but I, I want to see you deal with some stuff. Yes deal with some stuff maybe maybe just maybe what you're gonna have to deal with this morning is you're gonna have to deal with some soul ties so we got generational curses and then there's and what we want to do is we want to bring the blessing on our life well you know my granddaddy he was a good one Woo! i love being around granddaddy he was drinking all the time he was a mess he was drunk he was overrun by a spirit of alcoholism. And if you didn't deal with it and you're dealing with it now, you're still dealing with the alcoholism yourself and you don't pass it on to your own children, then just know this, that same spirit that rode him until he died is now riding you. And what it desires to do is ride your children. Are y'all with me? No, what you got to do is you got to use what's on the inside of you. Greater is he that lives inside of me, the presence of God that is on. And take authority. I have a right to take authority over this enemy right now. In the name of Jesus, it stops right here. Amen. Same thing with soul ties. Generational soul ties. We done connected ourselves with people that we know are not good for us. Many times, I'm going to say this. Many times it's gotten sexual and there's been all kinds of things transferred in our life. You know, we think, well, you know what? I slept with that girl. I slept with that guy and, I, and it just didn't work out. And we just left. No, no, no. You didn't just leave. You're still connected to them. And see, and see, this is what happens so many times in church. Have I got time? This is what happens so many times in church. We just, we don't, we don't understand why I'm having a deal. I don't understand why I'm emotional. I don't understand why I can't have breakthrough. I don't understand. Maybe it's because there's some soul ties that are there in your life. And maybe the only person that can break the soul tie is the person that created the soul tie. And that is you. And we come to that place when the presence of God shows up in our life. And when his presence shows up in our life, it's just like looking in a mirror. When we look in the word of God and we read it, it's reading us back. And it shows us things in our life that we must deal with. 
You ever been around, you ever been around or maybe you've dealt with it where all of a sudden you just, I don't know, man, I just, I got I to gotta deal with something. I got to deal with something. Maybe, maybe that's what God's showing you is that in order for you to get to the place to where you want to get to and have the breakthrough in your life, is you got to deal with some soul. Maybe, maybe you got to deal with some unforgiveness, you know. Man, I, I, that, that girl hurt me to the core. And I guarantee you won't nobody else ever do it. Even my new wife. That's my first wife right there. I guarantee, and the last one too. <laughs> <laughs> she, she knows us too well, all right? Yeah, you know, they, she hurt me so bad or he hurt me so bad, I'll never deal with again. So this one right here, they know where they, their line is. No, what they know is you got an anger issue. They know you got a problem that you still have not dealt with. Come on, there comes a time when we have to make, we have to come to that place to where we make ourselves available for God to use. Amen? If we want to be the type of person that God uses, we have to be a person who dares to be different. You're going, we're going, we're going to be different. I'm not going to be like all the rest. When you make yourself available, it's going to make you different. Some, somebody say different. It's going to make you different. It's going to pull you out of your comfort zone and make you different than everything else. This is why David, when David ran down there, all of the other people, the whole nation was there. All his brothers were there. The, the, the giant was in the valley. And the giant had been taunting them. And David goes down there to take them a sack lunch. He's like, hey, here's your lunch. Mama sent it. Who's that? What's he doing? I'm hearing what's coming out of his mouth. Won't somebody kill him? They turn around to him and say, won't you go back home tend to those few sheep? You know what David does? Somebody give me a rock. Somebody give me a sling. I'm going to be different. I'm going to be different. I'm going to step out of my comfort zone. I'm going to be different. I'm going to deal with the issue. Have y'all been there? Y'all read that? Y'all know what he's talking about? And what does David do? David comes out of there with his rock and his sling and the giant laughs at him. David starts spinning around. He had five smooth stones. I don't know why he had the other four. Some people say he had four, the, the, the giant had four brothers. I don't know. He'd be pretty cocky if that was the case. Man, I got one of them forever, one of you. And he comes, he, that's a good shot. He comes out. And the giant says, I can't believe you sent a little boy out here, a little shepherd boy out here to fight me. I'm a champion. And David looks at him and says, you come to me with your shield and your sword. But I come to you in the name of the Lord. Today. Today. Not tomorrow. Today. I'm going to knock you out, take your own sword, and cut your head off, feed your carcass to the birds. David lets his sling go. It hits him in the only unprotected place. You know why? Because he wanted to, he was different. He trusted his Lord and it hits him in the forehead. The next picture we have is David standing over holding the giant's head by the hair saying, is this what y'all was afraid of? There has to come that place in our life to where we become different. When you read these di different, about different people like Peter, Peter was different. Peter got out of the boat. He could have sat in the boat. Paul was different. Paul's life completely changed. And this is what is required of every, my life, I understand, eight, 19 years ago, 19 years ago, you know what? We could have, I could have stayed comfortably, comfortably, or what I thought was comfortable, in the Methodist church. My goodness, I had been to school for five years. My goodness, it had cost all kinds of money, and it would have been so easy. But you know what? All of a sudden, I find myself sitting in a room where there is no air conditioning, there is no chairs, and there is nobody. And you know what? I, here's what I determined. That if God be for me, who can be against me? God will make a way where there seems to be no way. You got to get to the place to where you're not moved by your circumstance. You don't learn to be different. I'm going to do what God's word says to do. My pastor. 
He was my pastor. He's gone on to be with the Lord. I'll never forget his testimony, Jamie. You know what I'm talking about. His testimony was he too was in the Methodist church. Man, all he knew that God wanted to do something in his life. He wasn't sure how that was going to take place. He knew there was more. And I believe that's where some of you are this morning. You know there's more. Maybe what God wants to do is different in your life is maybe he wants you to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. With the tongues. I said with the tongues. My pastor used to say, you, you don't even go to town by shoes without the tongues. So you, go, you want it all. Yeah. He started the church. They had six folk. And him and his wife was two of them. And I, that'll, that'll knock the wind out of you. Six folk. In a little shotgun Methodist church with a pot belly stove in it. Out in the middle of nowhere. And all of a sudden he decided. He had read about the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire. This Methodist preacher wanted it. He was hungry. He wanted more. Wanted more. So you know what he done? He went after it. He got to the point where he said, I want to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a Methodist. He'd been sprinkled. He'd been... And he got baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. A little while later, he got filled with the Holy Ghost. With the tongues. His church exploded. You know why? Because he goes back with this boldness of being different. And he says, he takes a, he takes a whole fifth, or whatever you call it, of of olive oil quart gallon whatever <laughs> i'm trying to find y'all amen <laughs> work with me all right <laughs> y'all looking at me like <laughs> he crazy <laughs> when i said fear some of y'all said there you go <laughs> lord it's getting hot in this place you know <laughs> <laughs> he took that olive oil <laughs> and he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I need to, I'm gonna pray for, I wanna, if there's anybody in this room that needs healing, he done got filled with the Holy Ghost, Chris. He said, if there's anybody that needs healing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for you to be healed. And one woman, one woman stands up. She's got a neck brace on. She'd been in an accident. And she walks down there and he takes that oil. <laughs> he ain't never done this, puts it on her head. And all of a sudden, she says, "Woo!" And she takes her neck brace off, throws it on the ground. Says, I'm healed. It scared him so bad, he picked it up and said, no, you ain't. Put it back on. <laughs> he said, all I could see was her suing me, you know what I mean? <laughs> so put it back on. She said, took it off. Yeah, I'm healed. And guess what? That church filled up so fast that people actually had to sit out in the parking lot and look in to be able to see. I'm telling you where the presence of God is, people will come. Catch on fire for God. People will come watch you burn. They'll watch you burn. They'll watch you burn. People want to see somebody that's on fire for God, burning for God. Oh, that's my heart's desire. Say, God, I'll burn for you. I'll burn for you in everything that I do and that people will see that in my life. Make yourself available. Dare to be different. And then I'm going to close it. Y'all come help me. I'm going to close it with this. I got 40 more points, all right? <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to jump to this one, all right? If you want to be used by God, then you got to have a stark reality of understanding. That one of these days... You're going to die. You're going to die. I wish that I could tell you he's going to live forever. I wish I could live forever. And I want to tell you, you can. You can. You can live forever. These bodies are going to wear out. And it's painful. And, and these bodies are going to die. And this flesh hurts. But brothers and sisters, listen to me. When you get a stark reality. That I'm going to die one of these days. And, and what I want to do. More than anything. 
is leave my mark in a positive way for a generation of little boys and girls to see. And that's, that's, that's what makes me so angry with adults. You go back there and go back in the clubhouse and try it sometime. Go try it and serve. Go in the clubhouse and watch them when Pastor Paul and Casey says, we want to pray for you. And the little kids, just like they did during VBS, they'll come and their tears will be flowing. Some of them the shaking, the presence of God. And they'll say, what, what do you want to pray for? I want to pray that mom and daddy will stop fighting. I want to pray that daddy will stop being mean to mama. I want to pray that mama and daddy can get back together. Listen, 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 listen. Listen to me very carefully. They are watching everything. And they're getting their lead from you. We want the next generation to be changed. They begging us to change. We want the next generation to be different. They're begging us to be different. They want to see us be what we claim to be. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. I, 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 don't, I don't do this. I don't do this well, but I'm telling you in this room right now, you may not ever come back. You may say, you know what? That's a crazy preacher over there. I ain't going back over there. Well, well I got you right now. And I want you to know something. That no matter what you've done, you are loved. And God died for you. You said, well, pastor, I've done this. God, that's why he died for you. He took on, the Bible says, he took on the sins of the world. So that he could die and nail it to a cross. <laughs> but you got a part to do. And it's just a matter of saying, today, everything changes. Today. I look back on my life. Me and Donna would be married 39 years this year. It's next week, ain't it, buddy? I look back on our life. And I look at all the times that we drug the kids to church. Back then, y'all, we had church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and you better be in Sunday school. Lord, we was in church more than we was at home. I worked a job, worked 60 hours a week. I was required to work 60 hours a week. We go to church. Can I tell y'all something? I don't regret a minute of it. I don't regret a minute of it, Chris. And you know what my heart's desire is? You know what just blesses my heart? And I, y'all say, well, you're the preacher. It ought to be that way. It ought to be that way with you too. Amen. To where your kids will come and they say, you know what? I may not know a lot of things. But I know that that man and I know that that woman loves the Lord. And when the time comes, mama and daddy, and it will, when they need somebody to lay their hands on them, guess who they're going to come to? They need to be able to come to you. And you know what we need to be able to do? We need to be able to lay our hands on them. And speak life. Because no matter, my son's 36 years old. 
And to this day, he still looks at me like, Like that 10 year old boy wanting to go fishing. Now he's grown, married, two kids, and I see him still looking at me that way. You know what I still want to have, Chris? I still want to have the answer. Because the answer is always what it has been it's always Jesus. You know what I'm saying, Ray? It's Jesus, man. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. It's Jesus. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking, they're looking at us to see Jesus. Show me Jesus. Go back there. Go back there and ask him. So. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not going to have no cry party. I don't do that. So how about it, mama? How about it, daddy? How about it, brother? How about it, sister? What you going to do about it today? You want to be the type of person God uses? It always requires more presence. And I can't give you that. God can't even give you that. He's maximized his presence and made it available. We just got to step into it and receive it.